images and stuff like that but i feel like that's the extent that we always use we know it causes some negative impact and fresh is always better but then there are some newer technology that kind of help to make those frozen product actually as good as the fresh one as well so there are some changes that we need but we just don't have that data yet so Hello, meat folks. Welcome back to the Meats Pad Podcast. It's your happy and hungry host, Phil Bass. Um, today we have uh, um, Dr. Derrico. And Derrico, you're going to have to say your last name. I don't know how to say that. Last name is Satya Brada. Satya Brada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's pretty, oh. pretty mouthful, but it's all right. Derek, it is. It is Derrico is just fine. Derrico's, Derrico's fine. all right. Okay. Yeah. Well, Dr. Derrico is uh, from the uh, University of Arkansas, and we'll get to that here in a little bit. But um, I, would, I just had a chance to visit a little bit with him about some of the research he's been doing, and I think it's very relevant um, because it's interesting. We in the meat business have been have been using freezing yeah. for a very long time, but we don't really know what's going on. We <laughs> exactly, haven't studied it, exactly, right? And, yes. and I think mm -hmm. we're finally starting to get to a point where not only do we need to better understand it from a, uh, a, a cold chain um, production standpoint, but then also like, how is that affecting quality? And so there's been Definitely, a little bit in the past, yes. but tell me a little bit, where are we right now with freezing um, uh, as, as an industry, understanding freezing, and then also mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about the project you, you mentioned. So I think for, from what I've seen so far, at least, we definitely as an industry use a lot of freezing. We freeze them, we get them, we either blast freeze them or like we put them in deep freeze. Um, so we d do that a lot, but then I feel like with the newer technology coming up, like faster freezing rate and how we're actually processing our samples, definitely there's a lot of changes with that, but then we just don't know. We just, we know that freezing increases some tall loss and things like that mm -hmm. because of the damages and stuff like that. But I feel like that's the extent that we always use. We know it causes some negative impact and fresh is always better. But then there are some newer technology that kind of help to make those frozen product actually as good as the fresh one as mm -hmm. well. So there are yeah. some changes that we need, but we just don't have that data yet. Yeah. So, well, I want, so I want, before we get into your project a little mm -hmm. further, I want, you mentioned something, um, that there is damage mm -hmm. to, to the muscle yes. and, and, and being more specific, it's kind of at a cellular level. Is that exactly, right? Exactly. Yes. Let, okay. Share, share what's happening. Um, as far as, as what is happening at that cellular level, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. Um, but then also, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So, or a thing? <laughs> well, it's definitely a thing. So what happens is when we freeze muscle, we muscle is pretty much, um, meat is a pretty much 70% water or mm -hmm. like around that area. And then all those water freezes and it becomes ice crystals. Mm -hmm. And depending on how fast you freeze them, some of those ice crystals really damage your cells. Mm -hmm. And then those cells are where we actually keep those moisture. And once it's damaged, then uh, once we thaw them, that's where all those moisture start to leak out. And then that's where all the damage from the freezing kind of come up with the discoloration, more like moisture loss and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely happening on that side. Uh, but there are some potential benefits in mm -hmm. there. Uh, there are some studies that shows that with those damages, it's actually improving tenderness and potentially aging it as well mm -hmm. when we're aging them. But um, Definitely on that side, a lot more new uh, studies need to be done to make sure that we're seeing those consistently and how we can actually optimize those process. Yeah. But so there's some, generally we see that there are some negative impacts, but then I think if we learn about it more, we can make it into a positive way that, hey, this product, even though it's freezing, it's frozen, it's actually able to be improving your quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the past, you know, folks would think of freezing as, as a, a negative uh, situation, and I believe it, it. It it probably stemmed back to when processors finally started to tr truly embrace freezing as a means to uh, maintain a type of product. But maybe mm -hmm. it was already real close to its end use time, right? Maybe. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. now we're 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 making a more deliberate decision to freeze, yes. right? And mm -hmm. so now we're trying to figure out when is the good time frame. And in fact, as you've mentioned. Um, it does indeed improve tenderness, yes. but you, you said we also could 
encounter some other challenges mm-hmm. like color issues yeah as well. so i think and it's so. really depend on how we're doing it right now because whenever we do study like we do it in the perfect conditions oh yeah we're fast freezing it single line and things yeah. like that making it like very fast yeah but then when we're doing to the industry we're just like hey put them all in a box and then put them in the freezer yeah. and that tro- totally change everything <laughs> put so. them all in a box stack all the boxes, boxes on together. a pallet yes. into one big cube and then hope Hope we freeze that thing eventually, yes, and right? And I was like, maybe the center portion <laughs> over there is still like, you know, still kind of fresh for yeah. like three, four, five days before it's frozen. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, and I think there's some research out there being being done right now with some other institutions trying to figure that side out. Mm-hmm. I know our 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 group uh, is very interested. Yeah, in, I think that would be pretty cool to well, see like so. what's the actual industry freezing practices yeah. and then how what actually they're doing what they're actually want to use I think yeah be pretty and what is happening you know what's the what's the gradient that's that's occurring in that you know and and what's mm-hmm. the quality now from the product that's maybe on the outside versus what's on so the very inside yes. right mm-hmm. and and I like to you know when I've described freezing in the past to folks I like to think of the muscle cell it's kind of like a water balloon and you mentioned it's, yes. it's mostly mm-hmm. water in there. Yes. and what happens mm-hmm. to water when it gets cold or when it freezes it expands um, so you're breaking that water balloon. You're also creating ice crystals depending yes. on how fast you're freezing. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. um, you're definitely having some expulsion of the contents at some point. And that's that purge loss that yes. we encounter. Mm-hmm. All right. Tell us a little bit about your project that you that, that you mm-hmm. mentioned to me. And it was on steaks and roasts. Yeah. So I got a couple of uh, study going on. We just actually finished it. So that study is we're looking into a different product size. So roast and size. Um, product size definitely impact your freezing rate uh, the smaller it is the faster the mm-hmm. products will freeze and then we're trying to see it from a standpoint of like how the size is different and then how it the different freezing technology kind of impacted so like on the industry side we know they're using blast freezer but then consumers also now able to buy you know if you go to bigger like club size of groceries things like that you can buy a whole muscle mm-hmm. and then you can depending on what they want to do they can cut into steaks or like they can freeze the whole thing and that that can impact really differently so we want to see as well how the kind of like your typical consumer freezing as yeah. well so like the chest freezer and then your refrigerator freezer uh-huh. i guess that's what i call yeah. it how that impacts the differences and quality from there wow so we find pretty cool results so from the row size um, we found that it actually have a better color compared to the steak. Uh-huh. Um, what we think is because we're able to actually get more fresh surface from the from the roast itself. If we are cutting into like we're making them into steak, we're able to get more better color from there. Mm-hmm. Um, something else that we found was there's a trend that the steak product actually have lower ten- tenderness compared to the section or like the roast size. Oh, really? So. There's a trend of that, and then overall, consumer did not find any differences. Okay. But then there's a trend for like the acceptability is actually decreasing with steaks, and then regardless whether you're using blast freezer, a chest freezer, or like your refrigerator freezer as a steak, it just continues to decrease. Overall. So, so it was noticeable to the consumer in, in an overall acceptability mm-hmm. stance. But then for um, scoring wise, it was about the same. About the same. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, about mm-hmm. the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, when you're talking about roast, describe the roast for me. Is it just like a a, a two inch thick? So for the roast, like it was muscle? more like so for the steak, it was about one inch, uh-huh. and then the roast was uh, probably about four to six inch. Okay, mm-hmm. all right, so pretty solid size, about about something you would see in a retail. Yeah, about something store. that you'll see on retail. We did three different muscles on this study, so we mm-hmm. used the loin, uh, the eye of round, mm-hmm. and the uh, top loin. Okay, and yep. then I think overall the eye of round and the loin, the strip loin doesn't really got impacted. The mm-hmm. top the top loin got mm-hmm. some uh, different results on that one. A little and different. Having a little bit more um, changes on the acceptability from the consumers. I think they have the most drastic one compared yeah. to the others. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Something that's been a, a curious to me, and I don't know the answer to this, but I want to get your, your mm-hmm. thoughts and hypotheses, is, is why do we see... Um, 
the the color instability of product mm -hmm. once we thaw that and try to display it in a retail case <laughs> because if you think about it there's definitely fluctuations during during the year and it's, it's it, especially if we're talking about beef right yes. let's, let's talk mm -hmm. about beef here okay and we have fluctuation in pricing during during the year and so there's better times to purchase certain cuts during the year yes and if we if we purchase them and maybe froze them brought them back out of freezing um, when the prices are high but we bought them low so we have a we have a good mm -hmm. price difference there yes. we still make a profit okay but we don't get that that good color stability so yes. tell tell me a little bit about what your thoughts on mm -hmm. are on on why don't we get a a a, a good color shelf Steve, life shelf previously life frozen yeah. product so i think the or at least what have been seen so far is like because of that when you burst that balloon like inside of that cell there's also a lot of other enzyme prooxidants and things like that mm -hmm. so when that burst those that previously was contained and then takes longer to be released now suddenly like a bunch of them are released to the system to mm -hmm. the meat and then that's been suggested to be the one that really causing a lot of more that instability so because of that more oxidation is happening more discoloration suddenly pops up mm -hmm. so big parts from there i think a lot of those muscle damages that contributes to their just loss of muscle integrity. Yeah, much. yeah, and the contents that are in there, the pro-oxidants, as you're mentioning. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of been my my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody's truly tested that. I think it'd be I, really cool to see. I think, I mean, if we're able to do some more, like, you know, type of metabolomics data and mm -hmm. things like that, getting more information on that, I think it'll be really cool just to see, like, what's actually being released on that. I mean, there's always the thoughts, like, oh, yeah, the irons being released or yeah. like the muscles losing those antioxidants and stuff but then no one's really maybe there's a couple old study that does that but then i think with the more technology analysis technology that we have right now i yeah. think if we can re-update those informations i think we can learn a whole lot more about what's actually going on yeah. in that process yeah. well derico for the listeners out there derico has uh, came from a a very powerful lab at purdue uh, with dr brad kim um, did, has yes. uh, uh has a good understanding of very large data sets and so it's mm -hmm. going to be cool to see how your career mm -hmm. advances with your I understanding so, yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's it's so far beyond my uh, my original training and my <laughs> level of expertise. And it's really neat to see folks like you coming in with this <laughs> whole new experience. And it's like it's like I had all I had was just a, an old hammer and you came in with a nail gun. And oh. now we're going to start building houses. Right. So something like that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's the part of it. Even for me right now, it's like, oh, yeah, I understand how to use it. But then what I used about like a year or two years ago, a lot of those informations is already like updated like three, four, five times already. And I'm like trying to keep up and I'm like, oh my God, this yeah. is real difficult. But yeah. then it's really, it's still really interesting. And then we're moving through towards the directions that we have a lot more data. And then can we actually use those data, analyze it on a different way, and then can we get new informations that we can use it to help our industry or yeah. things like that, or like find something new that we can help to improve the overall meat. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. okay. Speaking of that, mm -hmm. based on your your uh, experience with the research you're currently doing, maybe what you've learned in the past, um, what are some some recommendations for our processors who are listening mm -hmm. for freezing protocols? We've kind of talked about what they're kind of doing right now in yeah, many yeah, cases, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's probably not the best. And mm -hmm. so what would you recommend? I feel like... Uh, I mean, the products that you're using varies a lot. So, I mean, I wouldn't really tell you, it's like, hey, make it the product smaller or something like yeah. that. But then definitely try to freeze it as fast as possible whenever you can. Um, I think that will help you solve quite a lot of your problems, a lot of your perch loss and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it'll help to solve those. Um, I think that would be probably the easiest one to do is just making sure that you're not stacking everything like, you know, like three feet high yeah. and then causing a lot of like things slowly freezing. Yeah. Um, making sure your packaging actually stays intact nice in the tight. freezing process. Yeah. I think that will be really important because sometimes, you know, it looks good in the box and then after you freeze it, turns out it's the seal break or something yeah. and then it starts to 
actually will cause more damage with like potential freezer burns and mm -hmm. then later on when you thaw them suddenly a lot of purge comes out and more oxidation is actually going on from there yeah. so during that process um, I think controlling those two will definitely help a lot I yeah. would say yeah mm -hmm. so okay well you know and that's been that's been my experience in the past too I know it takes a little bit more uh, for the listeners out there who are processors to um, uh, take smaller bites I guess mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and freeze smaller units you know even if it's just boxes that have a little bit of air gap between them yes. right or a <laughs> slip sheet or something yes, that kind I think of allows for that help. yeah that 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 temperature to transfer mm -hmm. um, making sure you're kind of like wherever you're freezing them actually what you said having that air flows going around yeah i think that's important part because like that that air is the one that really freezing your product yeah. it's like the touching with the metals or something like that that helps but then that air in your blast freezer are the one that really moves your temperature down yeah. so making sure that the air has access to your products. That's right. That you have to. Important. You have to give it uh, a chance to share that energy yes. and, and pull mm -hmm. that energy mm -hmm. out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, well, good. Um, we like to ask uh, folks, uh, how did you get to where you are? How did you Ooh. become a meat scientist? And you're at the University of Arkansas, great I am school. Right now, yes. It's awesome to have you there. I'm glad <laughs> that you're there and and getting some good recognition. And so, how did you become a meat scientist? That is a very fun question. Yeah. I don't think. Uh, Growing up, I come from Indonesia. Uh -huh. Meat science is not a thing there. Yeah. Uh, growing up there, it's like the animals just look like, okay, that's I, I see cow, I see goats and yeah. things like that. And then I come into the U.S., they're like the whole system's very different. Yeah. So my background is in food science. Okay. And then about junior year, I saw like Brad posted like, hey, I'm looking for undergraduate works in meat science. And I never got taught about meat science. I don't know if I, what. What is that? What is like, this? Sure. And then I go and join there and it turns out it's just like, it's a lot of things. It's like, it's, you know, like for me before meat, it's just, all right, you harvest the animal, you got the meat and then that's it. And then there's yeah. just like a whole lot of thing behind it. If you don't take care of your animal, you're pretty much just destroying your whole product afterwards. Yeah. And then if you do everything good with your animals, but then you don't process them well, then you're also destroying your product as yeah. well. So. It's very fascinating for me to select those, those whole process, kind of how they're interacting. And I, I enjoy the biochemical work as well. And uh -huh. it's like very interesting how the whole thing works. So that's just, I don't know, it sucks me in after a junior <laughs> year. And then here, never expect to be a faculty in Arkansas, but here I am, faculty in Arkansas doing meat science. So it's been great. It's been fun. Yeah. Well, you've come a long way, man. Yeah, and is, and yeah. that's really cool. And uh, and uh, hopefully one day we'll, we'll we'll talk Dr. Kim into <laughs> joining us on the podcast. I think he will enjoy that. We'll I think get him one day. Huh? He, he loves to share, share his <laughs> research and stuff like yeah. that. It'll be really cool. Well, I've known, I've known Dr. There. Kim for a very long time. Um, uh, he, keeps, he keeps turning down his interviews, but I'd love to get him on here, to, especially <laughs> talked about Meat, meat and bus biology, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is our, our journal for the American Meat Science I think that would be really cool because so. those are open access journal. Yeah. And then some of them are, you know, like for our producers or processors, maybe for some of them that are interested, there are some, those are freely available for them. It might be, you know, it might be not as easy for some of them to understand it. But then the nice thing is like you can just contact those professors, mm -hmm. whoever listed there, and they'll be happy most most of the time to share with you what's going on and help you out with that or like yeah. share their study i think it'll be so i think it's a good a good thing for them to have i guess a good tool for yeah. them it's like something it, it's definitely the journal that uh that that uh, most hopefully most uh, american meat science association members are publishing <laughs> in um yes. you know it's 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 robust and uh for those out there listening derrico made a good point that um, it is open access which means it's free to access yes, and so yes. all you got to do go to the search in, go to the search engine type in meat and muscle biology journal mm -hmm. if you want to yes. and mm -hmm. and uh, you'll be able to access a whole mess of information and, and also like you said it's the, the authors are very willing and, and, mm -hmm. and helpful yes. um, to share that information. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah. Um, I, I didn't expect to get on to, onto the topic of the journal, but I'm glad we did. I think it's important. I think it's cool. important to talk yeah, it's about. Important yeah, so. Well, Derrico, thank you so much for joining us Happy today. To be here. And thank uh, you for yeah, we'll, me. we'll keep an eye on how your, how your research continues to progress. We'll do, yeah, keep on sharing what I have. Very good. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you.